Splicing and dicing DNA to create better or tailored life forms is no longer the stuff of science fiction. It's now being seen as a key scientific tool of the future. CRISPR-Cas9 is one of the most promising systems of gene editing and was recognized with this year's Canada Gairdner International Award. Joining us now to explore the potential and limitations of this emerging science in London, UK via Skype, Heidi Ledford. She's a reporter at Nature magazine. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, Joanne Cammons, Executive Director of AdGene, a nonprofit plasmid repository. And here in our studio, Feng Zhang, bioengineer and core member of the Broad Institute at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a co-recipient of the 2016 Canada Gairdner International Award. And Ron Perlman, Director of the Core Molecular Biology Facility at York University and he is Associate Scientific Director with the Gardner Foundation. And it's so good to have all of you. Congratulations, first of all, to everybody on this uh, remarkable achievement. Um, for a lot of our viewers, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this stuff is complicated. Thankfully, we have Feng Zhang here, mm -hmm. who did a little explainer for us that we're going to play right now off the top of our program so that after you explain it, we can all be the wiser for it. Okay, okay, here we go. Sheldon, let's roll that clip. Imagine if you are writing a novel and you are proofreading the novel and there are some typos you want to fix. Um, and let's say the sentence in the novel said twinkle, twinkle, big star, but you really want to fix it uh, so that it's twinkle, twinkle, little star. There are different ways to fix it. You can either um, get rid of the word big, um, that would read twinkle twinkle star. It doesn't capture the full meaning of what you are intending the sentence to be. Uh, and other ways is to just add in the, the little uh, word. So you have twinkle twinkle big little star. And that still is quite confusing. So what you have to do is you have to go in and replace big with, with little. And so one way to do this, you may give Cas9 a RNA that encodes twinkle twinkle big star. And by taking this uh, search string, uh, Cas9 can go, can go into the genome and try to find a place where the mutation matches twinkle twinkle big star. And then Cas9 would make a cut uh, in the word uh, big. And then by providing the cell with a repair template that carries the word little, um, the cell will repair this uh, DNA uh, break uh, with the new uh, repair sequence. And that's all there is to gene editing. So thank you and good night. No, no, we're going to have a bit of a conversation here. Fung, I want to know, first of all, that was very well explained. Thank you very much. What application of gene editing are you concentrating on in your particular research? Um, gene editing is a very exciting technology, and uh, we're focused on uh, several things. Um, one, we try to develop the technology so that we can make it even more powerful, uh, conquering some of the challenges that still face it. Uh, at the same time, we're uh, applying it to understand how the brain functions and how genetics uh, or genetic differences underlie different forms of neurological disease. And what are the neurological diseases or disorders that mm -hmm. you particularly are interested in dealing with? Uh, we're focusing on uh, neuropsychiatric diseases and also uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So things like autism, uh, schizophrenia, uh, and okay. Alzheimer's disease. Okay, Joanne, I want to go to you now in Massachusetts. Another area where gene editing is being explored as a way to sort of revolutionize human medical treatment is centered on using CRISPR on pigs. So start by telling us about that research. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's already been a lot of research that led up to this research to show that uh, pig organs might be sometimes used and are already sometimes used um, in human transplant. And so there are some limitations to that um, that the CRISPR technology is able to really address. So one of those is to quickly remove <clears throat> many of the proteins that make the human reject pig tissue. And uh, the Church Lab, actually, um, at Harvard, went about and did one of the largest gene editing single experiment changes, making changes in multiple genes at one time in the pig to get a little closer toward using the pig for an experimental animal. Um, and also, uh, one thing that's already been done that I think is interesting is um, a human pancreas has been now um, you know, grown in a pig and some gene editing used to make that more amenable for transplant, um, getting toward a cure for diabetes. And so that's, uh, I think, pretty exciting research. And the thing about CRISPR is it's very fast and it allows um, you know, research for cures to be accelerated. I should also say, though, that it's not just pig. I mean, we have reagents in our repository for almost every research organism that exists. And so 
from our perspective, it's not just the stuff that's close to the clinic, but it's the real diversity of organisms that you can now study, like the butterfly and the salamander that regenerates its own limbs. That was hard to do before genetically, and now we can really get in and do better modeling of human disease in all these organisms. Hmm. Ron, let's look back. How did CRISPR get its start in the first place? Well, that's a very important question and a very important point uh, for the public to be aware of. So CRISPR is not, um, it, it's not an invention. It's a natural process. And it came from understanding a great deal of basic science. And so a lot went into it, started in the late 1980s when a Japanese lab originally found these sequences. And then a lot of very detailed and hard work went into trying to understand uh, what it was. And much of this work, and this was recognized in the Canada Gardner International Awards, was done by food scientists who were interested in the question of how bacteria are protected or protect themselves against infection by viruses. This is a very important commercial uh, aspect of the dairy industry uh, in making products from milk, uh, yogurt and cheese in particular. And so they studied at the very basic level how this process occurred. And that's where uh, the understanding of how CRISPR-Cas can make these very precise cuts in DNA came. And then from there, another group of scientists studied the mechanism uh, and they were interested just in the mechanism. And how long ago are we talking now? This was uh, not very long ago, between 2010 and, and 2012, really, maybe a little earlier than that. And as we see, Fung, in the band along the bottom of the screen, mm -hmm. it's CRISPR, C-R-I, that's not a misspelling, just so everybody knows, C-R-I-S-P-R. Why mm -hmm. is it called that? Um, a CRISPR is a name for, for the way uh, these systems look in the genome of bacterial cells. CRISPR stands for Cluster Regularity Interspace Short Palindromic Repeat. I am amazed um, you so remember that. It's an that. acronym for <laughs> CRISPR. And, uh, and it really means that if you look into the DNA sequence uh, for these CRISPR systems, uh, they are repetitive, and then they are um, clustered in, in the same place. And also there's little gaps that are fixed width uh, in the genome. Good. Let's go to the UK. Heidi, I want to get you into this because in a recent National Geographic magazine story, it looked at how CRISPR could be used to battle mosquito-borne diseases, including malaria and, of course, the very notorious Zika virus, which has been so prominent in the news lately. And I want to read an excerpt of that story and then ask you a question. Sheldon, if you would, let's put this up. Anthony James, a molecular geneticist at the University of California, Irvine, is acutely aware that releasing a mutation designed to spread quickly through a wild population could have unanticipated consequences that might not be easy to reverse. Quote, there are certain risks associated with releasing insects that you have edited in the lab, he said, but I believe the dangers of not doing it are far greater. All right, let's, can you just pick that apart first of all? Do you agree with this notion that it, it's better to do as opposed to not to do? Well, I think, you know, that quote is a really excellent way to frame a lot of the debate around one particular application of CRISPR-Cas9, and that is the use of CRISPR-Cas9 to create what's called a gene drive. So, um, you know, a gene drive is essentially a mutation or a form of a gene that can spread itself through a population very quickly, um, much more rapidly than normal. So normally when you think of gene editing, you think of uh, editing in an individual, an individual organism, even an embryo, what have you. Um, when you talk about designing a gene drive, you're talking about trying to uh, remodel an entire species, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people, you know, if you go back to what Fang Zhang was saying earlier uh, in that, that great description with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, some people have called a gene drive essentially a, um, a search and replace function, but not just for one document, but for an entire species. Um, so that quote from Tony James really sums up, I think, both the promise and the risk of this, right? That you know, the promise, the idea of getting rid of malaria. I mean, a world without malaria or even with significantly less malaria, that's amazing. You know, that's an incredible thought. It gives you goosebumps to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of reshaping an entire species and an ecosystem, you know, that carries a lot of risk. Those give you goosebumps too, but in a different way. 
Well, follow uh, so up on that really if you would. Disbalanced. Yeah, follow mm -hmm. up on that if you would, because uh, I wonder if in your travels you talk to people who wonder whether or not we are moving too quickly or too headlong into real life practical applications of stuff that is pretty far out in some respects. Well, you know, one thing to say, I guess, about gene drives is that they are, there's been some work on them to show that it may be possible to do this, uh, but they are still some time away. I mean, I would say years and years away from actually being ready to be deployed against, say, malaria. Uh, so there is still time to have some of these discussions, and there are uh, a lot of discussions ongoing about whether or not, you know, how you should design these, how you should test them, should you even test them at all in the field, uh, and those sorts of things that are still going on. Joanne, can I get you to weigh in on that and whether there are any concerns you have about the speed and pace of discovery here? Yeah, I think it's just not that easy. Heidi's exactly right. It's going to be a while, and we'll have time to really work out a lot of the kinks. But, you know, if you're someone who's suffering from malaria or some other rare disease that can be treated with this type of technology, um, you're not going to want to slow that down. So um, as a, I think as a society, we have responsibility to talk about it. But uh, I, it also gives me goosebumps, Heidi. <laughs> I think that the potential is great. Let's do a more practical application than wiping out a particular type of disease. Fung, let's talk about agriculture. Mm -hmm. There is gene editing going on by agricultural scientists mm -hmm. hoping to do what? Um, there are many applications where you can use uh, gene, genome editing to introduce uh, useful, uh, helpful traits into crops. Uh, so for example, you may put in a trait uh, into soybean so that uh, it becomes more drought resistant. Uh, it will tolerate colder weather and maybe get rid of trans fat uh, at the same time. Hmm. And, uh, and you can do this for many other crop species as well. So we could have better food and be thinner all at the same time. Um, that's the idea. That's the idea. Heidi, uh, we know that when, well, I think we know that for decades there have been some pretty strong debates about the nature of genetically modified organisms, GMO foods, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of controversy around that. Do you think the public is more likely to accept gene-edited food as opposed to GMO food? Yeah, it's a complicated question. I think, you know, there are maybe some people who would be more likely to accept that. I mean, there's a, there's a certain uh, fraction of people who are opposed to GM crops who don't like the idea of a foreign gene coming in from, you know, another species and crossing species boundaries that way. They may feel more comfortable with gene-edited food where you're not doing that. You're not transferring a gene from another species. Hmm. Um, and, yes. Oh, I was just going to, I was going to ask Ron to follow up on that in as much as I think there are some governments around the world whose regulators make the distinction between GMO and gene edited food. So if they do, perhaps the public will. Yeah, there are those distinctions in some cases. It, it is probably or it may well be quite an artificial distinction. But I think what's important, uh, what I was saying at, at the beginning about where this came from, that uh, part of that story is we have to do things like we're doing right now, and that is inform the public of many of these things. I think there's a lot of misconception about GMO, but also that this is a very natural, the gene editing that we're talking about is, is a natural process and it isn't introducing uh, foreign genes. So that's uh, one aspect of things that uh, I think is important. The other thing in terms of agriculture is this is not new. The only thing that's new about it is the speed at which we can do some of these things. I mean, agriculture has lived on genetics and breeding and plant breeding and animal breeding. Saskatchewan lives on rust-free and smut-free wheat. Mm -hmm. And that's all plant breeding, which is not, it's uh, genetic changes, but not genetic modification in the sense of the word that one introduces new genes, foreign genes. Well, let me get Joanne to follow up on that. The, the, it this is different, I suppose, Joanne, in as much as the speed of which things are proceeding is fast, and I wonder if it's going faster than our ability to sort of intellectually, ethically, legally, etc., in, in terms of a regulatory regime, figure it all out. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I think that the, um, you know, it's fast for scientists, and it's fast at the in the early stages, but bringing any product to clinic or to agriculture or to mass production 
um, is still very hard. That's why it costs so much money to make new drugs, new effective drugs, and new effective treatments. It takes money and time and people. And so none of these things are simple. The whole vision of uh, do it yourself in the garage, I don't really think that's happening. And we have indications that it's just not that easy. Hmm. So um, I think we'll have plenty of time to do the study and the regulation and these discoveries and these inventions will come one at a time and um, we'll weigh the benefits with the risks like we do with every type of therapy treatment or product and um, try and bring it to the advantage of humankind and not the disadvantage. Heidi, um, shame on me for quoting your competition before I quoted you. We did National Geographic <laughs> earlier. Now I'm going to, let's do a quote from Heidi Ledford in Nature Magazine. This is from your <laughs> August issue from earlier this year in which you wrote, the zeal with which researchers jumped on a possible new gene editing system called NGAGO earlier this year reveals an undercurrent of frustration with CRISPR-Cas9 and a drive to find alternatives. I wonder what should people understand, Heidi, about the limitations of CRISPR and other gene editing tools? Well, CRISPR-Cas9 works very well uh, for certain applications, and it is a big improvement over what scientists had before. So there's no question about that. Um, for many applications, that's the case. Uh, there are still some concerns about the possibility of making changes that you don't want. So you know, you've targeted a specific section to change. You want to change big to little. Um, but maybe you accidentally change star two. Uh, that can sometimes happen. But labs like Fong's lab are uh, working on ways to, to minimize that. And there are some forms where that happens very infrequently. Uh, but the biggest complaint that I hear from researchers is really um, the difficulty of truly editing. So CRISPR-Cas9 works very well to, for example, delete out uh, big from twinkle, twinkle, st big star. Um, but when you want to take out big and put in little, in some cells, in some contexts, it's pretty, pretty difficult to do and the efficiency is quite low. So again, labs like Feng Zhang's lab and others are, are working very hard to, to come up with better ways of doing that. Well, Feng, let me follow up with you on that. Because, and again, using the example we had off the top in your video of twinkle, twinkle, big star to take out big and put in little, you, you almost make it seem as if gene editing is as simple as doing a word search in a Word document and voila, we're there. Mm -hmm. It's not really that simple, is it? It's certainly not, uh, it's certainly not <laughs> as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and, and the system works uh, well in some contexts, but uh, there are still uh, other contexts, other cell types where it's uh, challenging. So for example, um, uh, there are, the cells in our body can be classified in two different ways. They can either be replicating cells, or they can be cells that have terminally differentiated, so they don't divide and replicate anymore. Uh, an example of a dividing cell could be a, a, a blood cell, a stem cell yeah. that still replicate, and a non-dividing cell can be a neuron. Uh, we can do uh, things, we can make edits in these replicating cells pretty easily, but in uh, non-dividing cells, like in a neuron or in a muscle cell, um, making very precise changes is still uh, pretty challenging. How much? Then, I'm sorry. How much research is going into a lot? Figuring out all of a that. Lot. So, so yeah. we're very focused on, on doing that and working very mm -hmm. hard to to try to come up with the next set of solutions. Joanne, what limitations of gene editing do you think are going to be the most difficult to overcome? Yeah. So I, I see it from a sort of different perspective. You know, one reason why this is exciting for society is so because I think scientists are so excited about it and. When we're trying to explain why we're excited, it's not really the same reason. So um, one of the reasons that we're excited about it is because how much innovative technology at the research level can happen um, with this technology. It's not just one thing. It's not just editing um, the example that Fung gave, although that's the classic example. There's all kinds of ways that scientists around the world are using these tools. So. Um, you know, I think accuracy will continue to be the biggest thing that people work on for clinical and therapeutic applications. Um, but when it comes to basic research, you don't need quite the level of accuracy that you might need for that kind of treatment. And that field is booming in science. So we've distributed uh, reagents for CRISPR experiments to over 10,000 laboratories around the world. Um, a lot of those plasmids came from Fung's lab and, and from the other Gardner Award winners. And the whole community that is working in this technology has been very open and, and, and sharing with their materials. So it's going very fast, which is very exciting. And so um, I think we have to really look at the, the, the limitations for taking this to clinic continue to be, I think, accuracy. 
but I think that they're, that's not holding back a lot of research that's going to lead to discoveries for other therapeutic modalities that are not genome engineering. So you're going to get better cures and better drugs using this technology, but not using it as the therapy. Hmm. Is that clear? Yeah, uh, yeah. And but while you have the floor, can you tell me what open access to gene editing tools means? Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, we, we there's a you know a big movement to have more data open in science, and that's really good because the more scientists can look up information and have access to data, um, you know, the better it is. But but our, our organization works really on getting materials. So taking it one step further and getting the reagents, the actual tools that they need to use, physical samples, um, out into the laboratories. And, um, you know, Feng Zhang and the Broad Institute and, and uh, you know, Jennifer Doudna and the Church Lab and um, all these groups have been extremely forthcoming with their materials to making them available very quickly as soon as they discover them. And so that's set a very rapid pace of discovery in this field. Um, it, it's a little bit technical for me to talk about, but there are dozens of novel uses for these tools that m now other labs can invent because they had this early access to materials. Well, let me follow and up so with Ron. That, I think that's exciting. I'll follow up with Ron on, on that. How important or how ethically important, I guess I should ask, do you think it is that this open access philosophy is at play? Well, I think it, it's crucial that the scientific community certainly has access to these and that, that allows the development of the toolbox uh, and the basic science that leads to the development of the toolbox to proceed. And if I could just go back a little bit to the discussion about NGAGO and, and uh, talking about possibly frustration of the uh, potential um, problems with gene editing, the, the inaccuracy. Um, I think it's great that there are things like NGO, uh, NGAGO being worked on, but there are also all kinds of other things being worked on. Uh, Fung can talk about this, but his lab is, is very much involved in, there are many, many other CRISPR systems in bacteria uh, that are being looked at for other enzymes that might be more accurate and things. So one step at a time, and it's a work in progress. Right. So I'm not sure that it's a, a frustration. It's a, a, a delving and a uh, working to develop a better toolbox. Well, having it, said that, how proprietary is everybody with all of this, or are you sharing nicely in the sandbox? Um, it's, it's, it's not proprietary at all. Um, so Agin has done a fantastic job of uh, getting the reagents out. So, uh, for example, my lab alone, working with Agin, mm -hmm. will have sent out uh, over 36,000 uh, different tubes of reagents to scientists around the world. We should just say Agin is Joanne's yeah, outfit that's right. in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and also, uh, we also send out uh, things directly to uh, other researchers uh, around the world. Uh, we also try to make the, the resources, the protocols, uh, as widely accessible as possible. Um, Heidi, I hate to sound like a uh, you know capitalist running dog here, but is anybody making any money off this yet? Oh well, sure. I mean, I think uh, you know when uh, Fung talks about the distribution of these materials and you know encouraging everyone to use them, that is certainly the case uh, so far in academic research. Uh, but there are companies who are interested in in commercializing you know, the fruits of this invention, and uh, you know they are working out uh, potentially. Uh, more costly licensing deals with with these uh, these institutions. But this th this technology is being monetized at the moment. Well, um, so there are companies that are trying to develop, for example, human therapies based on on CRISPR Cas9 as a sort of a, as a way of conducting uh, gene therapy. So you know they're working on it now. They're not making any money off of it yet, but they have potentially paid you know to license the technology from from the institutions that hold the patent patents or the, the applications for patents. Okay, let me put this on the table here. This is from New Atlas from a year ago. Uh, it was an article published about do-it-yourself CRISPR editing. Do-it-yourself CRISPR editing, if you can imagine this. Okay, Sheldon, you ready to bring this up here? Dr. Josiah Zayner, a research fellow in NASA's Synthetic Biology Lab, believes that if CRISPR is the key scientific tool of the future, it's the tool amateur scientists should be experimenting with at home today. He's been running an online store for a while, now called The Odin, trying to facilitate and encourage do-it-yourself synthetic biology research at home. Ron, what do we think of this? Um, well, 
first of all, what they do and what they're selling, as far as I can tell, is okay. with bacteria. And that is moderately simple. I don't think we're anywhere near uh, do-it-yourself uh, CRISPR ability in your garage. I, I think... I think some nefarious uses could be, but they will could come, but they will be by trained scientists. That's I don't think this is at this point a do-it-yourself uh, process. I think the things that you can buy from Odin, my sense from looking at their website, uh, may be very useful in high schools, for example, for science fair projects. But what they're selling is for bacteria, not for anything else. So I, I think we're very far from a, a do-it-yourself uh, garage Well, having said that, enterprise. Joanne, uh, I mean, do we need restrictions in place to make sure somebody's minding the store and everybody's being ethically tickety-boo here? Yeah, it's just, it's, science just isn't that easy. I wish it were. <laughs> Millions of scientists wish it were so easy that you could do it in your garage. Um, you know, the equipment that you need and the training you know, a decade essentially of training. There's, there's not, ev not everything in science is written down in a book and in a protocol. You have a lot to learn before you're pushing the frontiers of knowledge. Um, and so I'll give you an example. You know, there was a very sort of famous startup trying to make a, a very simple experiment, basically, we thought, which was to make plants glow green, not just be green, but fluorescently glow green. And they said, we're going to you know, we're going to get a lot of money from a, an accelerator and we're going to do a Kickstarter campaign. And a lot of people gave money. So they had a lot of money and they had a few good scientists and they had a very quick timeline. We can do this fast. We can do it in a year. We can do it in two years. Well, it never happened. They were never able to do it. Um, it's just not that easy. Someday it might be done, but these types of discoveries take years and years before they come to fruition. Hmm. So, um, I, I just, I'm just not that worried because I just don't think it's that easy. And they are relatively expensive, and uh, that was just, just mentioned. You do need some equipment for analyzing and for knowing that you have the right thing. Uh, All right, should I throw an even more dangerous example on the table here? I shouldn't say dangerous. Let's just say uh, adventurous. Scientists in China experimenting with CRISPR on non-viable human embryos. Uh, is it, you know, in some, what's the expression? Is the toothpaste already out of the tube when it comes to these kinds of examples? Um, I think this is, a, this is a, one example of something that um, us as a scientific community have paid a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of uh, effort to try to think about what's the best way to, to um, organize our thinking and also uh, to be able to make sure that we're not doing things uh, that, uh, or doing things the proper way. So for example, last December, um, the U.S. National Academy the Chinese Academy of Science and also the UK Royal Society uh, all convened together in Washington, D.C. Uh, to, to have an international summit uh, to discuss the implications of gene editing and, uh, and also what are the ethical uses of the technology. Okay. Heidi, let me get you back in here and get you to address this issue. What area of gene editing research do you think holds the greatest promise in the near future? Well, I mean, I, to me, it's not so much the, the applications like gene drive and, and you know, work on embryos, human embryos that we talked about. It's actually more how it's fueling research right now. Uh, so it's really allowing researchers to do experiments in organisms that they couldn't work on in that way in the past and, and to really accelerate some of the work that they've been trying to do. I think that's certainly where you're going to see the most immediate impact um, right now you know in terms of the applications that we've talked about the agricultural applications are coming up quite quickly uh, so those you know may be the first that you see really coming to the market on them. Hmm. Joanne we've talked about pigs but let's also talk about salamanders what's happening with salamanders yeah, yeah so I, I just I'm fascinated with the opportunities that come from this sort of rapid technology so you know, uh, there's been an experimental model in a salamander called axolotl for many years. Um, and axolotls are known for the fact that they can, you can cut off a limb and they can completely regenerate it. So wouldn't that be great if we had better regeneration techniques for humans, nerves and tissue, um, you know, and, and growing things back that were damaged? So um, this has been a very genetically uh, in, in tran you know, uh, recalcitrant organism, and now scientists have got that working in these salamanders, which just means the way Heidi just mentioned, it's going to accelerate the research in the area of regeneration um, and you know, limb, limb regeneration and curing. And so 
um, that basic research, not involving a treatment that is genome engineering, but just studying that function in these animals is going to go much faster and we're going to learn a lot more and more specifically. And that's, that's really why scientists, I think, are the most excited about this. I want to make sure I just heard what I think I just heard, which is that they have figured out how to replace limbs in salamanders? You can take a salamander's limb off and reproduce it genetically now? No, no, no. Salamanders regrow their own limbs when they lose them. You know, if, you, you know, if you've ever played in the backyard and you had lizards, um, one of the things about axolotls is that if they lose a limb, it grows back. And so scientists want to study how that happens and understand it because obviously that doesn't happen with humans or higher organisms. And so using CRISPR-Cas9, they're really able to study regeneration and learn more about regeneration as a concept so that they can apply those principles to therapies and treatments, you know, in the future. Gotcha. Is that more clear? That, no, that is more helpful. And I, and I obviously <laughs> should not have dozed off that day in grade 10 science class when I did because I would have known that already. Uh, Fung, where's your research taking you over the next few years? Um, we are, we're continuing to develop this technology. Um, uh, we're trying to uh, really uh, try to not only solve some of the challenges, like the efficiency and the precision, uh, and, and also um, being able to insert DNA uh, more at will into the genome, uh, but also we're trying to develop applications. Um, how do you use this in, in cancer biology? How do you use this in neurobiology? Um, and, uh, and really making sure that this works well in the real world context. Uh, and then we're very excited to apply it uh, to our own problems of interest, psychiatric disease, neurodegeneration, and trying to understand what are the molecular mechanisms and, and maybe one day we'll, we'll be able to use this information to develop a cure. Hmm. Ron, we've had Gardner winners on in the past. I guess they call them the baby Nobels, right? Sometimes you win the Gardner, you're, you're on your way sometimes to winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, in which case, uh, I, I wonder what you hope this recognition through the Gardner Foundation Award will help do with CRISPR going forward. Well, first of all, the baby Nobels, it, it's true, about 30% of Gardner awardees go on to win Nobel Prizes. The number is 84 now in the relatively short 57-year history of the, of the Gardners. But what the Gardners do is recognize excellence in science. So we don't go in, our peer review system doesn't go in and say CRISPR-Cas this year. We're looking at oh, hundreds of nominations uh, and look for excellence. And so certainly the fact that five of the Canada Gardner International Awardees are in the field of CRISPR-Cas makes a big impact and makes a big impact. And they've all just spoken across the country from Vancouver to St. John's in 22 locations, including the high school students. So I think Gardner, certainly we hope that CRISPR-Cas is is on everybody's tongue as it is now, but it's mainly a recognition of scientific excellence. And this year, it happens to be CRISPR-Cas. Last year, one of the Canada Gardner uh, 2015 laureates is this year's 2016 Nobel Prize laureate huh. in physiology or medicine. There you go. So, so you guys plan your trip to Norway good. right now. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank Stockholm. Stockholm, sorry, <laughs> Stockholm, Sweden, not Norway. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on the program for a most fascinating discussion. Joanne Kamins, the Executive Director of AdGene in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Heidi Ledford, Nature Magazine, via Skype from London, UK. Uh, still not quite yet Brexited, but on its way, I gather. Uh, <laughs> Fen Zhang, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Ron Perlman, York University. Great to have you all on the program tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.